Um, so uh, this next talk I'm very excited to present to you because this is actually um, the first time that we've had the pleasure of having Ionis um, come to the FAST event and speak with us. So it's a really great honor to have Dr. Frank Bennett. Um, Dr. Frank Bennett is the Senior Vice President of Research at Ionis, Ph Ionis Pharmaceuticals, the first pharmaceutical company I ever called about four days after Quincy was diagnosed with Angelman syndrome. And I talked to Frank at that time, as well as Art Baudet and a couple of other people there. And, um, and we've been in collaboration and in discussions ever since, and that's been five years. Um, so this is really beautiful to see this coming to fruition. Um, and and he, he'll speak for himself, and I think he has a reputation that does stand on its own for most of us in this room. Um, but one thing I do want to just acknowledge is that he's the co-recipient of the 2019 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences for his contributions to discovery and the development of Spinraza. And as most of you know, um, as far as the ASO community is concerned, Spinraza is the holy grail for neurologic disorders and for intrathecally delivered drugs. So Ionis has really blazed a trail for ASOs for the entire world. And so a lot of other companies are getting into ASOs because they have led to show that they can be safe and quite effective. And Spinraza has been transformed because of Ionis. And so I just want to acknowledge that we're very grateful and honored to have you here and all the work that you have done for Spinraza. Uh, thanks very much, Allison. It's, it's really a, a pleasure to be here today. I've, I've been wanting to come to this meeting for the past couple of years, and unfortunately, my uh, uh, just things didn't work out. But I'm uh, really pleased to be here today. And uh, some of this talk you've you've heard uh, by other speakers, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time on uh, uh, some of the slides. But uh, I, I always think it's uh, useful to maybe rehash the same information a different way and uh, eventually it'll, it'll uh, I think help you understand and, and so the the first test here is can you see oligonucleotide uh, it's it's a uh, uh, I, I've heard uh, people butcher that word for, for many, many years, and, and so uh, uh, but hopefully by the end of the day you can see oligonucleotide. So what I, oh, I wanted to highlight that this is a, a joint project with uh, Biogen that we're developing a therapy for uh, Angelman syndrome. And Ionis, as you heard, uh, we do partner with Large Pharma, and uh, our other program in, in CNS disease is partnered with Roche for treating Huntington's disease. And so we've had the pleasure of working with a number of the pharmaceutical companies in, in the audience here today, and uh, look forward to continuing to work with them uh, going forward. Um, and so just as an introduction to Ionis, uh, uh, we uh, formerly were known as ISIS, and I, I think it's uh, obvious why we changed our name a few years ago. <laughs> Uh, we were hoping uh, the other ISIS would go away, but uh, they still haven't managed to, to do that. Uh, we're, we're located near San Diego in a little town called Carlsbad, and we have about 500 employees. And for the past 30 years, uh, the focus of the company has been on RNA uh, targeting therapeutics. Uh, we, uh, we've pioneered the development of antisense technology, and that's been the focus of the company over the last 30 years, and I've, I've been with them since the beginning. Um, and we've also pioneered the use of uh, uh, antisense uh, uh, technology for treating neurological diseases such as SMA and, and uh, Angelman syndrome. Uh, we currently have two approved drugs that are uh, being marketed for treatment of neurological disease that include Spinraza and Texeti. And we have uh, a large portfolio of drugs that are either in clinical development or approaching uh, clinical development. And I'll talk t to you more today about our Angelman uh, drug. And, and so, um, just again, you've seen this slide multiple times, and I, I don't spend a lot of time on it. But, but just to help you remember that uh, RNA is the molecule that goes between DNA, which is where you store the genetic information. So that's the hard drive. And protein, uh, which is uh, really a lot of the functional uh, uh, activity that's in, in the cells. It's our enzymes. It's the uh, structures that to help uh, support our bodies, et cetera. And so RNA is the molecule that help make the protein. And so, uh, it, as many of you know, uh, most of the current therapies are really focused on uh, proteins. So antibodies are uh, a platform technology that are being used to develop uh, drugs uh, for a variety of uh, inflammatory and cancers, and they, again, bind proteins. And then most small molecule drugs that are available today uh, are binding uh, directly to proteins and modulating the protein to help treat uh, various diseases. So our approach is really 
uh, to design molecules, and these are uh, small snippets of nucleic acid or small snippets of uh, DNA uh, or RNA, depending on how you chemically modify them, uh, that are designed to bind to RNA through Watson-Crick base pairing. So that's the uh, same mechanism that DNA binds to itself. And so we're really uh, able to exploit that. And when the drug binds to the RNA, it can induce a variety of things. So the most common thing it does uh, that we design into the molecule is it causes degradation of the, the target RNA. And if you degrade the RNA, you prevent the protein from ever being expressed. Uh, we can also design uh, antisense drugs to increase the amount of RNA that's present in cells, and that results in an increase in protein. And uh, sorry, the Angelman project is sort of a mixture between those two. So we're, we're uh, as you'll see in a second, we're, we're promoting the RNA to be degraded for this antisense transcript. That causes an increase in the UBE3 RNA and results in an increase in the amount of protein uh, produced. So uh, Angelman's kind of a very interesting project from that perspective in that it sort of mixes two different mechanisms of action. Uh, today, there are, are seven antisense drugs that have been approved. And interestingly, uh, they're all for rare diseases. Uh, they, they include a, a, a drug that was approved al almost uh, 20 years ago for treating uh, a, a viral infection that occurs in AIDS patients. And most recently, uh, a, a drug for treating familial uh, uh, colon micronemia syndrome uh, that was approved uh, in Europe uh, this year. So, um, both Biogen and Ionis have a large amount of experience developing drugs for neurological diseases. And as already mentioned, uh, there is this barrier that prevents drugs from getting in the brain. It's called the blood-brain barrier. And so ASOs being fairly large molecules uh, don't penetrate this uh, blood-brain barrier. And what we discovered uh, uh, many years ago was that if you introduce the drug directly into the fluid that surrounds the, the brain, this is done by a lumbar puncture into the space below the spinal cord, as, as mentioned this morning, that results in broad distribution of the antisense drug throughout the brain. So we not only uh, can treat the, the spinal cord at the bottom shown here, uh, but we, we, we've documented in multiple studies that we treat uh, 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 various uh, structures in the brain and, and can get uh, very robust effects in, uh, in different model systems. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of experience with antisense drugs. So we've treated over 9,000 patients uh, with drugs. So it's not 9,000 doses, but 9,000 unique patients that have been treated with antisense drugs. Uh, probably the, the most widely used drug today, uh, antisense drug, is for spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, where that drug alone has is, is treated uh, well over 8,500 patients. Uh, we've had clinical trials ongoing for various diseases such as uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, Huntington's disease, uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And so some of these are very large markets that uh, we're, we're uh, uh, developing antisense drugs for. So I think we've established both the, the, the safety and with the SMA, the efficacy of uh, uh, antisense technology for, as a therapeutic platform for CNS diseases. So uh, I'd like to turn my talk into what we're doing, uh, how we're developing an antisense drug with our, our partners Biogen for uh, uh, Angelman syndrome. And uh, just to begin, I uh, wanted to highlight, uh, you've seen this slide, multiple iterations of this slide, that uh, uh, there are various steps in the process, and they include a lot of the basic research that you've heard about historically. That's absolutely critical for, to, to getting us to where we are today. Without that basic research, we wouldn't have a clue of uh, how to approach a disease such as Angel Angelman syndrome. So your, your investments in that basic research has been very much appreciated, and, and it's paying dividends now. Um, the, uh, once we have uh, basic research, uh, you, you end up starting clinical trials, and, and uh, again, it's a staged uh, program where uh, the first clinical trial is going to really just only uh, evaluate the drug in a small number of patients. And so I know there's a lot of excitement today about uh, uh, the uh, upcoming clinical trials, but it should be recognized that uh, each trial will only look at uh, a small handful of patients initially. And, and the main reason is, is that you want to establish the safety of the drug uh, to make sure it's well tolerated before exposing larger numbers of patients to measure the efficacy of the drug. And, and so that process does take years. It, it, uh, for Spinraza, that took us five years, uh, which was really setting a record. Uh, 
uh, for how, how fast you can develop a drug. For a disease like Angelman, it may take longer. And, and so I think you have to be ready for some ups and downs in this process. Not every drug that, that you're going to be hearing about in the next couple of days is going to work. Uh, my hope is that they will, but uh, there will be some failures, uh, or likely will be some failures. And so it's important not to get disappointed uh, that we're doing the best that we can to bring the best medicines forward. Um, and, and so, um, Mechanistically, I thought I'd spend just a few minutes to talk to you uh, about how our antisense drugs are going to uh, address Angelman syndrome. And, uh, uh, and so everybody knows, you've already heard that uh, the paternal copy of the U UBE3 A gene is silenced. And for whatever reason, uh, nature has decided that uh, we don't need the father's copy of the gene, and so it's, it's being discarded. And unfortunately, if, if there's a, a, a genetic change in the mother's copy of the gene, uh, there's no U, UBE3A that's produced. And so what we're trying to do is uh, design a, a strategy that we can reactivate the father's copy of the gene and produce uh, a UBE3A protein uh, to compensate for the loss of the protein. And mechanistically, uh, it's important to kind of understand how that paternal copy of the gene is silenced. And it turns out that the UBE3A gene is backwards to a very large transcript called the UBE3A antisense transcript. And so the enzyme that makes RNA is called an RNA polymerase, and that's shown by the red blobs on this slide. And, and what a, a number of studies have, have documented, and again, this is some of the basic research that I mentioned, is that there is a trend, what's called transcriptional collision. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, where, where the two polymerases run into each other. And you can imagine uh, two cars going down a one-way street, that they run into each other and they both have to stop. And that results in uh, stopping transcription or stopping uh, the production of the RNA that's important for making the protein uh, of interest. And, and so with an antisense approach, what we've d designed is an oligonucleotide uh, drug that will bind to the target RNA and once it binds to the target RNA, uh, some very nice study that by my colleague Frank Rigo has shown that it destabilizes the polymerase uh, uh, that's being made from that RNA. And again, remember, we're not binding to the DNA, but we're, we're binding to the RNA uh, that, that's being formed. And so when we cleave that RNA with the uh, antisense drug, the RNA falls off the, the DNA. And that allows uh, production of the full-length UBE3A uh, RNA, which in turn makes the uh, authentic UBE3A protein. And so mechanistically, that's how we're trying to uh, compensate. And I have to apologize. Uh, this is my best uh, PowerPoint skills, and it's nothing at all like the video you saw this morning uh, uh, going forward. So, uh, Mechanistically, this is uh, very interesting. We, we started a, uh, a project uh, a number of years ago with Dr. Art Badet, where we published uh, the, the, this proof of concept that you can use antisense oligonucleotides to reactivate the UB, UBE3A gene. And in cell culture assays, we've shown that you can decrease um, uh, UBE3A antisense pr uh, transcription or production, uh, shown by the, the lines going down. And that correlates very nicely with an increase in UBE3A protein, uh, shown by the lines going up. And what, what you're seeing is uh, uh, two different antisense drugs uh, that were tested in these uh, cells, uh, and comparing it to topotecan, which you heard about earlier this morning, uh, which is a, uh, a cancer drug that, that also uh, reactivates um, uh, UBE3A uh, expression. Um, that works not only in cell culture, but we were able to document that it works in mice, and this is showing a, a single, or two different oligonucleotides, uh, showing downregulation of the antisense transcript in the uh, top, and then the production of the UBE3A protein at the bottom. And in uh, studies that were published in the paper, we documented that it had a beneficial effect in a mouse model of Angelman syndrome. And so with that, uh, we've started, uh, as, as I think was described, uh, a very extensive screening to find an antisense drug uh, that could be used to treat uh, Angelman uh, syndrome patients. And uh, similar to what uh, Michelle uh, talked about earlier, uh, we've, we've screened thousands and thousands of oligonucleotides in cell culture and uh, have taken uh, a, a large number of antisense drugs into animal models 
to show that we can, number one, engage the target, and then also that they're safe and well tolerated in the animals. And ultimately, uh, the, the, uh, have identified an antisense drug that's going forward into uh, clinical development. Um, this is just a, a highlight of some of the data. This is an example. It's not the drug, but it's an example of the kind of data that we're seeing. It was done with uh, collaboration with Stormy Chamberlain's lab, where she treated IPS uh, neurons uh, from Angelman syndrome patients and showing that we can increase the production of UBE3A protein markedly and um, with the uh, antisense drug. Um, so one of the keys for this program, and, and it is one of the reasons that uh, there was some delays, is that we've, uh, in, in our 30-year uh, you know, history, have identified that there are species-specific effects of oligonucleotides. So an oligonucleotide that works in a mouse does not necessarily work in a human. An oligonucleotide that works in a monkey doesn't necessarily work in a human. And so we felt it's very important to address this up front uh, so we have a lot of confidence. And so we had to create what's called a trench tank mice. And these are mice that are engineered to express the human gene in the mouse genome. And so uh, it allows us to be able to test antisense drugs uh, uh, to demonstrate that we are engaging the human, uh, human gene and not the mouse gene or not the monkey gene. And so uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the size and complexity of this gene, it took a long time to create these mice. And I'm happy to say that we've created them and uh, now have, uh, have completed the screening uh, through the mice and have identified uh, candidates that have uh, uh, been very effective at knocking down the, the, the uh, UBE3 antisense transcript in these transgenic mice. And so now, uh, similar to what Michelle showed, uh, that we do have a drug that's going into uh, uh, clinical trials, uh, so we have identified one. Uh, the next steps for the program is we have to complete the safety studies um, uh, that support uh, doing uh, the, the clinical study. Uh, we are currently uh, discussing the program with various regulatory agencies throughout the world, uh, so not only in the U.S., but uh, uh, we'll likely do studies in Europe and uh, perhaps uh, other countries in the world. And uh, currently collaborating with uh, physicians and uh, key opinion leaders for the design of, of the study. And, and our goal is to have a, a clinical trial start uh, uh, second half of next year uh, for this program. So again, very exciting times. Uh, so uh, as I said, this is exciting times for the community and hopefully you, you can really uh, get a sense of this. So. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's important to recognize that there are multiple clinical studies that will start, uh, have either started or will start uh, uh, over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, there's likely to be several antisense drugs that will start clinical trials, ours in, included. Uh, but it's important to recognize that each drug will have a unique set of properties. Uh, uh, even two different antisense drugs uh, will have different properties. And so, it will be important that you carefully consider uh, the pros and cons for each drug, uh, working with your physician. And also, uh, not every company is going to be doing the same clinical study, and so there will be different inclusion exclusion criteria for each one of our studies that uh, you need to consider. So um, if you are interested in participating in uh, one, one of these clinical studies, it's really important that you engage your uh, physician and, and discuss the pros and cons for each study and, and identify which one's the right uh, study to participate in for your family. Um, and then, as Michelle mentioned, there's also a number of educational opportunities that will likely transpire over the next uh, year or so that you can better educate yourself about the uh, uh, different pros and cons for each study uh, as they're going forward. Um, and, and I also want to put a plug in for the natural history studies that are on, ongoing. These are going to be critical to help uh, uh, create success for, for the, the, the clinical studies. So we're just starting clinical trials uh, for, for our drugs now. And there's a tremendous amount we need to learn about Angelman syndrome to be able to design the pivotal studies, if you will, uh, for, for going forward. Our, our, our colleagues at Ovid are really blazing that trail. And there will be a lot of learnings from the study that we, we, we can all take advantage of. Uh, but there's still additional information, and each drug is unique, and so we have to carefully consider it. So I would also encourage you to consider participating in, in uh, uh, the, the various one of the various natural history studies. 
And it's also a good way to identify whether uh, participating in clinical studies is the right thing for your family. Uh, uh, these are studies that aren't interventional, uh, but they, they give you an idea of what kind of a commitment is, is going to be required for uh, participating in an interventional uh, study. Uh, so, uh, as a conclusion, is uh, you know again, this is a very exciting time for for the field. There are multiple uh, clinical trials that will likely start over the next year. Uh, Ionos and Biogen are committed to uh, bringing a drug forward for treatment of Angelman syndrome, and we've made great progress uh, in identifying our drug candidate. We've gone through a very extensive screenings uh, to to get where we are today, taking advantage of uh, 30 years of knowledge about antisense technology. Um, and also, as I said, uh, participating in uh, natural history studies is, is going to be very important for the field uh, going forward. And finally, just to thank my colleagues at IONIS, and as well as our colleagues at Biogen for uh, 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 the project that we have today. And this wouldn't happen without our academic uh, collaborators. Uh, Art Bidet has been a wonderful collaborator that we've worked with for the past uh, five or six years, and Stormy Chamberlain at uh, University of Connecticut has been really helpful in uh, providing us reagents and providing us uh, data from some of uh, the, the testing on our compounds. And finally, uh, just to acknowledge the Angelman community and, and you guys for uh, your wonderful participation and your support to, to get us to where we are today. Uh, thank you. We have, we have one. Yeah. Could you talk about uh, what the spinal tap, how the uh, anti-sense drug will be able to uh, go all across the brain and how much it'll, uh, I guess, be active in the brain instead of maybe in just only certain areas that it's given in the spinal tap? Yeah. So I apologize. I'm, I'm trying not to get too technical on this, but uh, They're uh, quite sophisticated. yeah. <laughs> so our drugs are water soluble. Uh, so all the antisense drugs that you've heard about are quite water soluble. So when you inject them in the spinal fluid, uh, they uh, maybe one thing to back off is the spinal fluid is, is um, like a pond of water. It, it, there's very little flow in, in spinal fluid. And so when you inject into the base of the spine, the drugs are readily diffusible up and down the spinal uh, fluid because they're readily water soluble. And what we've identified is that mechanistically they diffuse from the outside, uh, not only spinal cord, but in the brain, outside in, uh, down uh, some uh, uh, channels called the perivascular space that, that kind of follow uh, blood vessels into the brain. The brain is the most, uh, uh, vascularized uh, organ in the body, so you have a lot of blood vessels, and so you have a lot of these structures that allow the drug to diffuse down the outside of the blood vessels and then radiate out uh, uh, from uh, those sites. So we've been able to document uh, uh, using time lapse as well as uh, more recently in patients where we've uh, put uh, radio labeled oligos into uh, uh, patients and can see that in humans, we, we do see very similar distribution that we do see in uh, uh, non-human primates or mice or rats. So we've been very pleased about how translatable the uh, 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 distribution studies that we've done in the smaller animal species and how they're translating to human uh, uh, clinical studies. So uh, we're fortunate uh, that, that these drugs do uh, uh, dis distribute broadly. We're also fortunate that uh, they are readily taken up by neurons and other cell types in the CNS. Uh, I, I don't know why, uh, but we're really trying to take advantage of that uh, and, and have been able to do so. Uh. Hi there. In your mouse model, did you find evidence of phenotypic rescue? Yes. Yeah, we, um, I don't remember all the, the details, it's been a number of years, but we did uh, publish that uh, almost all of the phenotype was rescued except for one, and I don't remember which one that is, I apologize, but it's in the paper. Can, uh, can I add to that? How yeah. about in the humanized mouse, not in the, the mouse ASO, but the humanized mouse you made that you gave the human ASO to, did you 
do phenotypic testing on those animals? Yeah, so those animals don't express UB, the way we had to make the construct, they don't express the U, UBE3A. And, and so there's no phenotype to, to measure in those mice. They're just exogenous, exogenously expressing the antisense transcript without the UBE3A. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.